I throw this ball, will you leave me alone? Okay, 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 I'm gonna throw it. I'm gonna throw the ball. Calm down. What up my channel? Welcome back to another video. I'm Jesse, and you're watching. Welcome to my Octubre wrap up. In the month of October, I read seven books. Technically, I read six books because one of these books I actually read in September and I simply forgot to include in my September wrap up because of who I am as a person. I am so excited to gush about these books because I had an amazing reading month in the month of October. But before I get into the book reviews, I have to give a big shout out to the sponsor of today's video, Ana Luis. I've actually worked with Ana Luisa before in the past and I absolutely loved my experience with them and I loved the pieces that they sent me. After our collaboration, I actually went on their website and ordered a few of their pieces for myself just because I had fallen in love with some other pieces on their website and I really wanted to continue to support them. But I would love to share with you the pieces that they have sent me to show you in this video. I love this layered necklace set. It gives off such a beautiful vintage vibe. I absolutely love the layered sets they have on their website. They have a few layered sets and I think that they're all so absolutely gorgeous. I also got these really beautiful earrings from them. They make such a statement even though they're quite simple. They remind me of something that a character in historical fantasy would wear. I just absolutely love the vibe that they give off. My gemstone is an emerald and they also sent me this really really gorgeous emerald necklace. I cannot wait to wear this. Akasha really wants to wear the necklace. I love that Ana Luisa is committed to sustainability sustainability and they offset 100% of their carbon emissions. I love seeing companies develop sustainable missions and on top of that they have such a beautiful selection of jewelry. I love that they don't just cater to one kind of jewelry wear. They have pieces that are really simple and understated but very classy. They have pieces that are really bold and make a statement and then they also have pieces that have a little bit of a creepy vibe which y'all know that I love. I love hovering between the space of vintage classical fashion while also loving all things spooky and edgy. So I just overall really love this brand. I'm so glad that they have decided to work with me again. And they are currently running a Black Friday sale. So it is the perfect time to get yourself a gift or to use the sale as an opportunity to treat a loved one some amazing jewelry since the holiday gift season is approaching. You can get limited offers at analuisa.com slash bowtiesbf. And I will also leave that URL in the description box. All right, now I'm gonna share my reading stats for the month of October. In the month of October, I read 2,818 pages, averaging 90 pages per day. My average star rating was 4.86. I read one romantic comedy, five thrillers, one romantic comedy, five thrillers, and one fantasy. Six of my books I read via audio and one book I read in the physical. So if my star ratings tell you anything, it's that I had an absolutely amazing reading month. When I was focusing on thrillers and oh my gosh, my enjoyment of reading just shot up. It was so, so freaking good. I just, I can't wait to get into these reviews. I did not get to all of the books on my September TBR, but I did start pretty much all of the books that I talked about in my September TBR video. Let us get started by talking about the books that I read for the thriller spooky reading vlog that I did, which I will leave linked down below. The first book that I'm going to talk about is Gods of Jade and Shadow. I loved this book so much. This is a historical fantasy set in Mexico and we are following a young girl named Cassiopeia who is toiling away in her grandfather's mansion. She is of lower status than the other family members in the mansion and one day she is cleaning her grandfather's chest and she accidentally frees one of the gods of death. In the process of her freeing the god of death from his prison, she gets a piece of his essence lodged into her finger. And so she has to travel with him into the underworld to help restore him to his final power. And if he is not restored to his final power within a timely manner, she herself will drain away and die. And I loved this book so much. I love the journey trope and getting to see two characters, one mortal and one immortal, go on a journey through the underworld. It was such a blast. There were so many god characters and fantastical characters. There were also just amazing inclusion of actual events that was happening in Mexico during the historical period that this book is set in. On top of that, I just loved all of the folklore and the writing and the mythology. The storytelling was 
top tier, okay? Top tier storytelling. I cannot wait to listen to this via audio because it's kind of told in the oral tradition. It's told as if you are sitting on your grandmother's knee, listening to her weave just a magical tale. Mm, the audiobook would be really fantastic if there's a good narrator for it. And of course, my favorite freaking character was Hun Kame, the god of death. He was so amazing, so powerful and stoic and strong, but also completely innocent and ignorant to the ways of the world since the world has changed so much during this time that he was locked up in. I just, I love that character when you have like a naive, powerful character it never gets old for me. If you want to hear more about my thoughts on this book, definitely check out that reading vlog. Five out of five stars. For that vlog, I also read Winter Counts. This is a thriller by an indigenous author and oh, oh. In this book, we are following Virgil Wounded Horse who lives on a reservation in South Dakota. Virgil is employed by his community to be a vigilante. And what he does is exact justice when the federal government declines to prosecute crimes that occur on the reservation. He ends up getting in deep with the drug cartel and this mystery turns into our protagonist fighting not only for his life and the wellness of the reservation, but also for the life of an immediate family member too. This book was a wild freaking ride. I listened to the audiobook and it was so great. The narrator did such an amazing job performing and I'm almost 100% positive that the narrator is the author. Part of what makes this book so strong is the relationships between the characters and the dynamics between those characters. I thought that that really was one of the shining points of the story. Now, Around the middle half of the story, it does slow down quite a bit, but that didn't really bother me too much because while it does slow down, it switches to focus more on the familial relationships and the relationship between Virgil and his off again, on again, love interest, Marie. And by focusing on those relationships, I think it strengthened the story overall. Not all thrillers have to be like action packed heavy constantly. It was still a five star read for me, but I do want to let those of you know about the pacing because I know some of you people who are used to reading like really fast paced thrillers might get lost, get a little bit bored with this one, but I absolutely loved it. You should definitely check out the reading vlog. And I want to read a little bit of the afterward from the author because he makes such an incredible, amazing point that I just want everybody to hear. The problem of federal authorities under prosecuting certain felony offenses on reservations have been well documented. Federal investigators generally have exclusive jurisdiction over felony crimes on reservation, yet they often decline prosecution in these cases, even when the perpetrator has been apprehended. Although the percentages vary from year to year, federal authorities frequently refuse to prosecute murders, assaults, and sex crimes crimes referred from tribal police departments. Recent figures from the government indicate that over 35% of all referred crimes are declined and over a quarter of those cases are sexual assaults against both children and adults. Y'all, you have to read this book. And the last book that I ended up reading for my spooky books reading vlog was Never Have I Ever. This is a domestic thriller about a woman who has a very dark past. She has buried her past as deep as she can, and she now lives in this cushy, suburban, well-to-do neighborhood. And one day during book club night, a mysterious but very beautiful strange woman shows up on the doorstep and threatens Amy in inexplicable ways saying that unless Amy gives her lots and lots of money, she's going to reveal just how dark her past actually is and also send Amy to prison. I found this book in a giveaway from Where the Reader Grows and I'm just so thankful to Chandra for sending me this book. Now in the reading vlog, I was not enjoying this book at all because so much of the drama in the book centers around the wives in the neighborhood and I just have very little interest in wealthy women's politics. I just don't care. I also was really frustrated with the blackmail situation and I talk more about that in the vlog, but I was just like, why is Amy letting herself get pressured into doing the things that this woman is asking her to do? I was so annoyed and just frustrated with the protagonist because the protagonist was handling the entire situation in a way that I would not have. And I was finding it very difficult to empathize with how she was handling the situation. Now, you're probably wondering why I gave this book four out of five stars. If you really want to know, you should watch that reading vlog. But the reason, but to summarize, there was the typical thriller twist and I was really surprised by the twist. 
But then the book goes on for another 30 pages and you think the story's wrapped up. And it's just getting started. So the first twist caught me off guard and the following twists shook me. And so the reason I gave this book four stars was not because it was particularly good, but because I was so shocked and impressed by the fact that I was able to be so freaking shocked by this book, especially because I wasn't even invested in the book for most of the reading experience. I will say about the twist, the twist is absolutely disgusting. It is morally reprehensible and it is going to be triggering for a lot of people. I can't say that I, I liked the twist and you'll understand why I can't say that I liked the twist if you've read this book because the twist is just so horrible to be honest. But I will say that the twist I thought was important because I'm trying to figure out how to talk about this without spoiling the book. The twist was important because it touches on an issue that gets passed over quite a lot. That's all I'm gonna say. Now this is the book that I read in September that I did not share with y'all. I read You Had Me at Ola and this is a romantic comedy about two actors. One of them is a well-established actor. He is very secluded. He's very private. He has a son that he kind of has obscured from the entire world because he doesn't want his son to have to suffer through the spotlight. I cannot remember these characters' names, so I apologize in advance. Our other protagonist is an up-and-coming starlet who is constantly involved in drama. She's always involved in scandal, whether she wants to be or not. And these two actors end up getting cast in the same television show. He is completely against this because he doesn't want to be associated with an actress that has such a tumultuous public image. But despite himself, despite herself, the two of them end up falling for one another and it's about their romance. Now, it is no secret on this channel that I'm not a huge fan of romance and it is not because I look down upon the genre, it's just because I prefer my romances to be in fantasies and sci-fi and most importantly in horror and thriller books. I don't like romances that don't involve horror. I know that's weird. If you're interested in me making a video talking about why that is, I will. I don't know that anybody would actually be interested in that. Anyway, I gave this book five out of five stars because I enjoyed it from start to finish. I thought there were some really amazing quotes. I thought that the conversation about the Latinx diaspora was so beautiful and I loved to see that. I also loved that there was non-binary inclusion. I loved that there was conversation about how to have a healthy romantic entanglement. I loved that the main characters had to go through a lot together. They, they were tested, they were challenged. And most importantly, the characters were whole and distinct outside of their love and their lust for one another. That's also a point of contention I frequently have with romance that the characterization just isn't complete and falling in love is not characterization, right? I would like a backstory. I would like personality. I would like mannerisms. There's so much that I need from a romance in order for me to enjoy it. I just loved all of those things and I also really loved the conversation about what it's like to live in the spotlight. We often don't talk about the pressure that is on people in the spotlight and the invasion of privacy and humiliating questions that people feel that they have the right to ask, the way that people feel entitled, like they own celebrities. All of that toxic fan culture was addressed and I really, really loved that. As well as the, under, the other side of the coin being like, okay, well, you're in the spotlight because this is what you wanted to do and this is what you signed up for. And I love that there was like really complex conversation about, okay, sure, you are in the spotlight for work, but that doesn't mean you're not a human being and that doesn't mean that you deserve to be treated as if you are inhuman simply because other people choose to elevate you, if that makes sense. Even as somebody who is on BookTube, which is such a small corner of the internet, right? And even though BookTube is such a loving and supportive and just wonderful place, it's still the internet. And so every now and again, you'll get a few people who feel that they have the right to ask you really humiliatingly personal questions or make wild assumptions about your personal life simply because you're on camera. And it's just this trend of dehumanizing content creators. That doesn't go with, with just BookTube, but it goes for anybody who's on YouTube. At some point in their YouTube journey is going to encounter the hypercriticism, the speculation about their personal life. And the great thing is that the freaking vast majority of the YouTube community, of the BookTube community, I mean, is just simply amazing, full of nothing but incredible people. I still say that BookTube is the best place on the internet. And I'm not just saying that to 
make my subs happy or anything. No. Whether I had a channel or not, I would still be saying this. You will not find more loving, supportive, engaging, just really interesting uniqueness and also civility because the internet can be such a savage, uncivilized place, you will not find a more overall positive community than the book community. And I think even when the book community is messing up and doing things that are like problematic or racist or unhealthy, majority of the community, I think is still willing to be corrected. I think the majority of booktubers and people who watch booktubers are open to being educated and not just about social issues, but just open to self growth because that's what reading is. Every time you read a book, you grow as a person, right? Every time you read a book, you your way of thinking is challenged in some way, shape or form. Even if you're always reading the same genre, reading is always gonna be an exercise in empathy because even if you're reading the same genre over and over again, right? Even if you're always reading, let's say adult fantasies, every book is a new opportunity to try and empathize with a character, right? I was not able to empathize with this character, but the exercise in trying to empathize with her still, I think, improved me as a person. It still gave me a, um, I'm sorry, I'm just going off. But the point is, I think readers and the reading community is the best simply because I think that readers are particularly situated in practicing empathy. And those who practice empathy tend to treat other people better overall. Okay, I'm sorry for the impromptu discussion. This was not supposed to be a discussion video. It's supposed to be a wrap up. I also did a reread of Nosferatu by Joe Hill. Now, I, I don't know if I should call this a reread because I read through the first half of the book two years ago and then I didn't finish it. So I just reread it start to finish. I don't even know how to talk about this book. If I gave the true synopsis, this video would never end. It's a very complex book. It's also a chunky monkey. It's 700 pages long. So that's why the synopsis is long. But basically what this book is about, it's about kids who are able to use an object that they really love to transport themselves into another plane. The book starts out by us following a 12 year old girl named Vic McQueen who finds she has the ability to ride her bike to discover any object that she wishes. Let's say her mom lost a bracelet. She can get on her bike ride her bike and then this bridge appears and when she goes through the bridge she ends up wherever the bracelet is so basically this bridge allows her to find things that have been lost and our villain is a modern day vampire i'm not going to explain how he is a vampire because i think that it spoils it but he is a vampire the book is based off of nosferatu and he likes to collect these powerful people. And so he sets his sights on Vic the Queen when she is young. And the book is basically about this lifelong battle between the two forces. And it is so good. The vampire's name is Charlie Manx and Charlie Manx is able to use his classic car in order to transport children to what he calls Christmas land. And so basically he abducts children and takes them to this land where it's always Christmas. In case you're like, okay, that sounds super sketchy. It's not a pedophilia thing. How do I talk about this book? I doubt that this will ever happen again, but this is the first horror book to ever make me cry. And I cried not just once, I cried three times actual tears rolling down my face. I had no idea that a horror book could make me cry. This one did. And the reason that I cried was because I was so attached to the characters. I believed in them so much. And you go through so much with these characters. They grow, you grow. It's just, it's insane how much these characters are put through, how much they live and experience. And so their motivations became my motivations. And again, my empathy set off and I ended up crying at several points throughout the book. One of the things that made me cry is that Vic's partner, her life partner is a very large man. And it was the first time that I'd ever read a book about a, about a fat man where he was allowed to be a hero and a protagonist that had full characterization and he wasn't used as the butt of a joke. Now, of course, there are characters in the book who do make fat phobic comments towards him, but I just loved this character so much. He was amazing. And I loved the role that he played in the book. And I ended up crying because I just loved him so much. And I cried for other reasons throughout the book. It just was so good. Now, a lot of people don't like this book because it is really slow and it, it is long to get through. But the horror, when the horror happens, Oh, it's just so vivid and sick and disturbing. And I just loved every second of it. I will say that there are a lot, a lot of content warnings for this book. It is a very gruesome, 
disturbing book. It involves child death. It involves sexual assault. It involves a lot of really disturbing things. So definitely look into content warnings before reading this book. But I loved the writing. I loved the quotations. I loved the characters. I thought that we had one of the most complex villains that I've ever seen. I loved Charlie Manx. Okay, Charlie Manx, bees knees. I loved Vic McQueen. He is the shit. I loved what Joe Hill did in this book because he gave us a strong, powerful, bold, swearing, tattooed, no holds barred woman who was not afraid to fight for herself and the people that she loves. But she was also allowed to be weak and sensitive. She also really loved the men in her life. Like sometimes when we get these strong female characters, they're not allowed to have any weak spots or soft spots. Joe Hill is officially one of the three male authors that I trust to write female characters. And I'm not saying that male authors can't write amazing female characters because they totally can. But what I'm saying is that anytime I now go into a Joe Hill story, I don't have to worry in the back of my mind about having to experience some kind of sexism, some kind of sexist portrayal of womanhood. I don't know if that makes sense. I just, I loved this book. It was so freaking good. And if it would be a really good book to read for Christmas if you are in the mood for something really spooky for the Christmas season. Oh, and another thing I will say is I highly recommend listening to the audiobook because the narrator did an amazing job. Now, her voice took me a little bit <laughs> of time to get used to, but I loved how she threw everything into her vocal performance. There are times when she would literally scream. It was so good. And maybe that's because she's an actress by trade, but she did an amazing job. And I think the audiobook would also be a good way for those who are nervous about approaching such a chunky book to get to experience it without having to be stressed out. I also read Blacktop Wasteland, which is an adult heist novel about a man named Bug who is trying to escape his life of crime. He's moved on with his life. He has an amazing wife and an amazing child, and he's putting his past behind him on the straight and narrow and currently owns a mechanic shop. But when some scheming partners of his past show up when he is in dire straits, about to lose his house, desperately in need of money, he agrees to pull off one last and final heist except this is a heist that he may not walk away from. Okay, anybody who is a gearhead and loves cars and vehicles is going to love this book. I was invested start to finish. I thought that it was written really well. I listened to the audiobook. The audiobook was amazing. It was so good. I also love the social commentary in this book about race and class and about assumptions and stigma and also just about trying to escape who you were or trying to be somebody different than you've been before. There also was really great representation of black fatherhood and exploration and conversations about fatherhood. And I love just how badass our protagonist Beauregard was. He is just such an intelligent, pragmatic, but also he's he's got a temper character. And I love those characters. I love my characters that are not hot headed, but when they finally get pushed to the point where they're hot-headed it's on like donkey kong you know what i'm saying i really loved this book five out of five stars also in september i read when no one is watching by Alyssa cole this is an amazing thriller and in this thriller we are following a woman who is trying to fight the gentrification of her brooklyn neighborhood when her neighbors start disappearing one by one a devastating chain of events unravels and she begins to wonder if she is truly losing her neighborhood or her sanity we're also following her neighbor, Theo, who is recently divorced, breaking up with his awful wife. And Theo too gets wrapped up in the mystery of what's going on in the neighborhood. Now, the reason I say thriller the way that I did, for those of you who haven't seen my last discussion video, which was titled something along the lines of white authors don't get to define what's scary, racist side of commercial thrillers, I will leave that link down below. I explored when no one is watching at great length in that video. And I emphasize the word thriller because there are a lot of people who are undermining this book's merit as a thriller simply because they are approaching it the same way you would approach a white domestic, more commercial thriller like Never Have I Ever. And that's very problematic and unfair to black authors. So if you want to check out that discussion, it is going to be linked in the description box down below. But basically I gave this book five out of five stars. I listened to it in audiobook version and it was 
amazing. It was amazing because it terrified me to my core. There was so much horror noir in this book. The horror of gentrification, the horror of living with the threat of police violence, the horror of having to experience racism day in and day out and of being profiled. All like the horror of the black experience was so powerful in When No One Is Watching. And it is something that way too many non-black reviewers failed to acknowledge and way too many non-black reviewers failed to recognize that that counts as horror. But I also thought that the characters were really strong and I enjoyed their interactions. And I loved the mystery that was going on in the book. I thought the mystery was freaking amazing. And the audiobook was just absolutely amazing. I have a physical copy on its way to me from the publisher and I'm so freaking excited because it's definitely something that I'm going to be rereading in the future. <sighs> It was amazing. Oh, and the last thing that I want to mention, it's not a book, but it is a bookish podcast called Nightlight. Nightlight is this podcast where black authors share spooky stories and a lot of these stories are actually published. So I listened to season one of the Nightlight podcast throughout the month of October and the stories were just amazing. You have so many amazing, well-established black authors providing creepy and spooky stories and the stories were just so good. But you also have some up and coming and new emerging authors on the podcast and I just really loved them. So I'm gonna leave that link down below because they are a new podcast and I really want them to be supported. I don't want them to have to close down. They're just so amazing and they share spooky stories once every two weeks, I believe. And there's three seasons of their podcast out so far. All right, y'all, that is gonna do it for this video. If you made it this far in the video, comment down below with the word light and or you can leave the light bulb emoji just because I ended this video talking about the Nightlight podcast. Also because a lot of these books had spooky vibes and after reading them, you may wanna sleep with a nightlight. Thank you so much for watching another Bowties and Books production. If you liked this video, please give it a big thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I would absolutely love it if you became part of my bookish family. All of my social media links are in the description box below. Stay safe, wear your mask, and I can't wait to see you in my next video.